Uh, next up is uh, Jonah Vilsack, Assistant Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the IU School of Medicine. Um, and Jonah's group is focused on the development and application of state-of-the-art uh, simulations, uh, which in, in the end help drug discovery and design. So Jonah and his team uh, are some of the largest users on Big Red 200 and our uh, Carbonate GPU cluster. So Jonah, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate your time today, and we certainly are looking forward to your presentation. All righty. Thank you so much. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm Jonah Vilsack. I'm an assistant professor at the IU School of Medicine. And um, this is the Hitz building where we work. Some of you are probably pretty familiar with it. And as, as Mike introduced, um, I think it was Mike, did I get that right? Matt, I'm so sorry. I'm learning a lot of new names today. <laughs> um, as Matt said, you know, my, my group focuses on using high performance computing resources to do rigorous computational chemistry and calculations for structure-based drug design. And so what I thought I'd do today is, you know, since this is my first time kind of, you know, in front of the group and to Bloomington, I thought I'd kind of introduce myself a little bit and, you know, the, the people in my lab, all the people that you see running the jobs on the cluster, um, share a little bit about how we use uh, RT technologies uh, and resources for our research. And then with any time left over, kind of dive into a little bit of the science without getting too deep. Um, so if that sounds okay, we'll go ahead and, and continue. Okay, so um, my background, I'll just go over real briefly. Um, you know, as a, as a scientist, I am a computational chemist and theoretical biophysicist. So I got my PhD in computational organic chemistry with uh, Bill Jorgensen. And a lot of my PhD focused on looking at small molecule interactions and thermodynamic properties and trying to compute these things with computer simulations. Um, and we also looked at, you know, evaluating our computational parameters, you know, trying new things out. But inevitably, you know, we, we used two main methods. One was quantum mechanics and we used the program Gaussian. And so I'm sure some of you have probably uh, helped users across the university use Gaussian for, you know, looking at small molecule properties as well as chemical reactions. Um, and so I had some experience doing that. And then the rest of my PhD was focused on molecular modeling. And I'll show a little bit about what that is in the future if you're unfamiliar with molecular modeling. Uh, at the time we were doing Monte Carlo, uh, Metropolis Monte Carlo sampling of chemical degrees of freedom and molecular interactions. And then, you know, as I graduated, I moved on and did some postdoctoral training in theoretical biophysics. And we started to increase the scope of, of what we were studying from small molecules to large macromolecules. And I was specifically interested in kind of the interactions between small molecules and proteins. And you can imagine how this starts to enter the realm of drug discovery, because a lot of drug discovery efforts, especially structure-based drug discovery, you have some macromolecule that you're targeting, usually some protein or an enzyme, and you try to design a small molecule that fits within the machinery of that protein, gums up all the gears, blocks its function, and therefore you know, induces some medicinal, uh, medicinal uh, therapy and, and treatment and relief. And so on a computer, you know, we can start to, to try to model some of these interactions and use the computational simulations to try to engineer in greater complementarity and specificity in our small molecule binding to a, a desired drug target. And a lot of this work at, in my postdoc training at the University of Michigan was, was with the program called CHARM. And if you're familiar with molecular dynamics or molecular modeling, you often hear programs like CHARM thrown out or AMBER or GROMAX. And so CHARM really fits into those family of, of programs. And then back in 2019, right before the pandemic shut down the world, uh, I was lucky enough to start at IU School of Medicine and, and get things started. And I think I was actually here like a, maybe like a month or two and I went to a, a, an IT seminar or gathering up at IUPUI and, and met a couple of you guys. And then the pandemic happened and I never saw anyone ever again. So. <laughs> So it's nice to be back in person. It's nice to see you again and, and reconnect. 
Um, so that's a little bit about me. And, you know, my lab has, has steadily grown over the years since 2019. So I have, uh, you know, my group here at the bottom, I have two, two wonderful PhD students. So Monica and Mike. Monica is a fourth year student. Mike is a third year student. Um, I believe you've met Michael Robo, who was a postdoc in my lab. So he came down back in October when you had your research day conference. And I was very sad to miss that. I was out of town at the time, but I'm glad that he could come. So even though he has officially left my lab now, we continue to work together and collaborate on, on a variety of projects. Um, and at his departure, I was able to recruit another postdoc, Andreas. And then I also work with Murphy, who's a post-baccalaureate research technician, actually in a different lab than my own, but he comes with a computer science background and, and wanted to learn how to do some molecular modeling, computational chemistry. And so I, you know, I feel very fortunate to be able to work with these people. And I figured it'd be nice for you guys to be able to put a face to the name when you see all these users on Big Red 200, you know, hogging up all your GPUs, right? So um, I'll, I'll happily take the blame for that because they do good work. Um, and that, that really leads me into, you know, what I wanted to kind of segue into that, into the next section of my talk, which is, you know, like, what are the resources that you guys provide that we use and, and that we love? And as a faculty member and, and classroom instructor, you know, I've been very lucky and fortunate to be able to implement some of your technologies into the classroom and wanted to start with that. So really, since I, I joined IU in 2019, I was invited to help participate and teach in this G807 structural and chemical biology class. And this is a really fun class. It's a 10 week class. It's split into two parts. The first half is all about structural biology where the students learn about like X-ray crystallography, cryo EM, single molecule structure determination, um, structural biology in general. Um, and then the second half is focused on chemical biology and drug discovery. And, and we teach the students, you know, typical steps in drug discovery and, and what's involved and what are the considerations, you know, starting from, you know, idea into preclinical studies. And, you know, one of the things that the, the course directors uh, invited me to join and, and do immediately is to, is to teach the kids how to do docking and how to do virtual screening, how do you use computers in a drug discovery pipeline. And when I first started to dig into this and started to research, you know, how could I teach the students, you know, those principles, uh, I found the research desktop and have loved it ever since. And so, you know, the research desktop has been a tremendous help for us, both in the classroom and in our research lab. So even just for this class, you know, these are the programs that we use in a, in, in a given semester and we have for the last, um, well, I guess, three and a half, if you count the current semester that we're in. So PyMol and Chimera are molecular visual, visualization programs. CCP4 and CUD are actually new additions that were just added this year. So thank you for, uh, for everyone's help in, in getting that up and online. And then, you know, we've been using Autodoc tools and Autodoc Vina. And I can't stress enough how wonderful this has been for us. So just as, a, as an example, you know, one of the reasons we switched and uh, wanted to install CCP4 and CUDE is, you know, last year in the structural biology aspect of the class or, or first half of the class, uh, the instructors were asking the students to download the programs to their personal computers and to run through a complicated exercise. And unbeknownst to the group, the, you know, I think it was CCP4 had just uh, updated its code, and now all of a sudden it, it would not work on Apple computers for whatever reason. And so there's huge compatibility issues, huge headache, huge problems. They almost could not do the exercise at all. Um, I think the solution was the instructor actually had the students come into their lab and use a dedicated workstation. It was a nightmare. Uh, but we got this loaded onto the research desktop this year, and it's worked beautifully. No compatibility problems, no complaints, no headaches. Everyone's been able to complete the exercises. It's streamlined everything. It's been fantastic. So whoever works on the research desktop, let me just say thank you and great job and keep it up because it's amazing. Um, and then of course we use research technology uh, resources in my lab's research on a daily basis, right? And so in conjunction with doing rigorous physics-based molecular modeling, we need large computational resources to perform this research uh, on a you know, rapid timescale with quick turnaround. 
And so we are heavy users of Carbonate and Big Red 200 uh, supercomputers, and we love them. And we especially love these wonderful GPUs that are installed in there because they make our life incredibly easy and they make our research much, much faster. So just for like fun comparison, when I first started, we were trying to do some of our simulations on Big Red 3. You know, we could paralyze everything onto multiple CPUs. And I think it took us about a month to run a 15 nanosecond simulation for uh, uh, modeling insulin bound to the insulin receptor. Now, fast forward to today on Big Red 200, I think we could probably do the same simulation in, I'm gonna say five days. So it's an extraordinary acceleration for us. So thank you for all that you do to maintain that. And in conjunction with using powerful computers, we also need a place to keep our data. So we routinely use the Slate and Slate project spaces for both individual project work and group collaborative efforts. And these together have really, you know, really enabled my research program to get off, get off the ground and, and get running. And then I'm gonna throw in another pitch because I love it so much for the research desktop. If you guys don't love it, then you will by the end of this talk. <laughs> but we use this on a daily basis in research. Uh, I use it, my students use it, we love it. And we do it for, we use it for all kinds of things, you know, just routine cluster access. It makes everything so much easier. Whether we're working from home during the pandemic or whether we're in the office, it doesn't matter. We can log in. Everything's right where we left it. It's, it's fantastic. So cluster access, job preparation, as well as data analysis and job visualization. So looking at our results, you know, later I'll talk about molecular dynamics and I'll show what a molecular dynamics trajectory looks like. And on the research desktop, we can immediately open the trajectory and start looking at it right away. We don't have to transfer it from the HPC systems to our personal computers, although we sometimes do and can. You know, we can immediately open it. We can start gaining qualitative uh, understanding of the chemistry that we're modeling, of the interactions that we need to then go in and measure on a more detailed basis. So it really streamlines and makes everything much, much nicer for us. And then, you know, for training new students, it makes things so much easier. So many of the PhD students that come into the PhD program at the School of Medicine, you know, very few of them have any kind of computer programming or CS background or even exposure to Linux. And so being able to get them onto the research desktop where you've got this GUI interface, they have the file explorer that they're used to, and then they can compare that to the, the Linux terminal and really start to draw comparisons between them and learn how to use Linux has really accelerated just training people that come into my lab. And each year I've had, you know, two or three students that will come in and work for an eight week rotation period just to learn what we do, to get experience on it. And this makes it much, much easier. Um, and, you know, the results kind of speak for themselves. So because of the resources that you guys offer, you know, we have been able to be very productive as a lab. So these are just publications that my lab has been able to contribute to or put out um, that have used the RT resources that are here at the university. So many of these are collaborative papers. And then, you know, last October, you heard Michael talk about our works in developing uh, the ladybugs free energy method. Um, that's in preprint, and we hope to be able to get that out later this year. And then just having these resources available enables future research to be done. And I was very fortunate and count myself very blessed to be able to have received a recent NIH grant, the R35 award for new investigators. And that would really not be possible if I didn't have the computational resources that you guys provide. So. I can't say thank you enough for all that you do because it has a significant and positive effect through all kinds of researchers across the university. Now, in my interactions with the, you know, RT resources, I think of the supercomputing, uh, you know, Big Red 200, uh, Carbonate, all these resources that, that we use on a, on a regular basis. But I'm appreciating that there's so many other divisions within RT that are equally important and equally contribute to the growth of the university, the growth of researchers, programs, events, and everything else that goes on. So again, just thank you for all that you do. Um, okay, so with that, um, I thought I'd kind of transition into some of the science. So um, 
If you like science, welcome. If not, then strap in because we're going on a ride. Um, so, you know, my research program is still very young. I've been at the university about three and a half, four years. And as I mentioned, you know, I'm a computational chemist. We do computational chemistry and we're interested in applying computational chemistry, developing new methods, ap applying these methods to all kinds of new research areas. So structure-based drug design, as I mentioned, you know, being able to model small molecule interactions to protein drug targets, to understand how they work, how they interact, and how can we improve uh, compounds to become potential therapeutics, right? We're also interested in using our methods to understand how changes to a chemical system affect that chemical system, right? And so we're pretty familiar with the idea of drug resistance. We know bacteria and viruses will change. You know, how many COVID variants have we heard about and changes in the spike protein? We know that these things change. And so, you know, one of our active research areas of interest are looking at these changes. How do mutations, how do changes in organismal protein targets affect the ability to target them with small molecule therapeutics? And then also protein-protein interactions. How do these changes affect protein-protein interactions? And, you know, what can we learn from that? How can we use that to, to improve human health? Okay, and again, you know, why are we doing this with computational methods? Well, because drug discovery is expensive, right? So back in 2010, Stephen Paul and coworkers actually at Eli Lilly published this fantastic figure estimating how much it costs to move a drug from idea to market launch. And in general, they said it's going to take you about 10 years and one to $2 billion. Well, I don't know about you, but that's way more than my budget. So, um, you know, the idea is that with computers, we can really start to understand on an animistic level, how do molecules behave? How do they interact with one another? And we can use that information to try to guide experimental design of new therapeutics. And that's really our goal and our aim. So what computational tools exist? Well, I think we could have an hour long seminar about all the different kinds of computational tools that exist to help in drug discovery. But these are the ones that we love and that we use on a regular basis. So we use molecular dynamics, molecular docking, virtual screening, and alchemical free energy calculations. And so if you're not familiar with these, that's okay. Um, just wanted to review them a little bit and then tell maybe one or two little stories about how we're using these at the university or how we've used them in the past. So molecular dynamics is straight, straightforwardly put, just a physics-based approach to model the movement of atoms and molecules as a function of time. So in the course of history, people figured out how to get atomistic resolution and structural models of proteins, and even you know, small molecules bound to proteins. And so here we have an image of a crystal structure of beta secretase one, this was an old Alzheimer's disease target. And beta secretase one is an aspartic acid protease. So it, it takes, takes peptide chains and chops them in half. And for the progression of Alzheimer's disease, that was bad because it's chopping in half the alpha beta uh, peptide that then aggregates in the brain is a telltale sign of Alzheimer's disease. And so the idea was if you could stop this enzyme from chopping that peptide, you could then prevent these aggregates from forming. But in actuality, that didn't really work out. But it's still a great target and still a great example. Uh, but you know, as you can appreciate, it's not moving. And so with molecular dynamics, you can give motion to these structural models. Because we know that proteins don't just stand still in our bodies and in solution. They, they, they wiggle, they move. And with molecular dynamics, we can apply physics on an atomistic level to understand what are the forces that atoms are exerting on one another Forces make the atoms want to move. Where do those atoms want to move? How far into the future are they going to move in that direction? And just by iteratively looking at atomic positions and atomic forces, we can calculate movies of atomic motion. And you know, just in this example, we have in yellow a small molecule that's bound to the protein in gray. And you can see it's dynamic. It moves around. Sometimes the rings kind of wiggle around. They might even flip. Some of the loops of the protein will open and close. And with molecular dynamics, we can model all of that. And it just gives us a deeper understanding of the chemistry that's going on and how we can perhaps change the molecule in yellow to fit better into this cavity of the protein. Now, if we don't know where the molecule fits, then we can do molecular docking and virtual screening. 
These are methods that allow us to try to position molecules into a known binding site on a protein in an energetically favorable manner. And it also allows us to screen through large libraries. So common in drug discovery is this idea of doing a high throughput screen to identify hits. So what that means is Eli Lilly has this large library of compounds that they have physically synthesized over the years and that they are keeping in a little test tube and, and maintaining. And when they have a new target, they're going to bring out each one of those compounds, put it into the target and measure, does this actually bind? Does it inhibit its function or does it not? And you can imagine that the robots necessary to do this kind of assay, the storage of the compounds, everything, it just adds up. It's expensive. It takes time. It's expensive. So the idea is we can do this on a computer. We can take digital copies of our compounds. We can stick them into the receptor using energy evaluations. We can calculate, is this more favorable or less favorable than a different compound? We can rank order the compounds according to specific properties that we're interested in and hopefully identify a small manageable number of compounds that we then would wanna test experimentally. And so this is a way of trying to accelerate the discovery of new therapeutic compounds without having to have each one of those individual compounds in hand and, and test them one by one. And then once we have those, we can then move on to the so-called alchemical free energy calculations. And this is very much what Michael talked about back in October. And the idea of these free energy calculations is, you know, say we have a compound that binds to our protein target and we wanna know how to change it to make it better, how to make it bind stronger, how to make it more selective. Alchemical free energy calculations allow us to in introduce a change to the chemical system and measure quantitatively, is it better or is it worse? And these are these relative binding free energy calculations. So in this particular example, we just have you know, a very small molecule it's a five-membered ring with a little blue methyl group sticking off of it. And we might wanna change that to a red isopropyl group. Now the blue and the red are just colors to help you focus on them and see them, that they're not actually blue and red in, in real life. Although I guess that's debatable. I mean, we always color oxygen as red. So is oxygen really red? I don't know, but anyways, you know, we can, we can change one functional group into another and we can calculate a difference in the free energies of those two states. So we can calculate a relative free energy of binding, this delta delta G of binding to say, okay, is the red functional group, is that better or worse than the blue functional group? And historically, these calculations have been very hard to do. They've been only, you know, they've only really been done by experts in the field. And that was for a variety of reasons. They took a really long time. They're very complicated. They're hard to, to set up and they're hard to analyze. But fortunately in the last decade or two decades, you know, things have really turned around where more and more people are using these types of calculations. It's like, why? Well, the computer architecture, the computer hardware is improving. We have GPUs that are incredibly fast now. We have software packages that are utilizing the advanced hardware, right? The GPUs, and we have more accurate models. And so the goal in computational chemistry, especially in new developments are really to, you know, try to make these types of calculations more accurate, to make them faster, to make them more accessible so that we can more successfully guide molecular, de molecular design. Um, I don't know how much time I have. Okay, um, so in our lab, you know, in my postdoctoral training, I was assisting with the development of the Lambda Dynamics method. In my lab, we continue to use the Lambda Dynamics method. This is an alchemical free energy method, certainly not the only one, so you might have heard of like thermodynamic integration before or free energy perturbation theory before, FEP or TI. These are complementary methods that a lot of people in the field use, but we really like lambda dynamics. And we like it for the reason that, you know, in conventional free energy calculations, you have to have multiple simulations that are, you know, staggering the transformation of one functional group into another. But with lambda dynamics, we allow our coupling parameter to scale dynamically with our molecular dynamics simulation. And in a nutshell, this lets us get the same answer with one calculation. And we think that's much better. We think it's much more efficient and it's a lot easier to keep track of. But even more than that, with lambda dynamics, we can also expand the number of perturbations that we explore. So we can look, we can look at not only transforming a hydroxyl group into a methoxy group as we had before, but we can look at transferring it to many other groups, a methyl group, a cyano group, a chloro group, an amino group. 
And we can do this not only at one site, but we can do this at multiple sites. And so now you can start to imagine in a single calculation, we can gather statistics and information about transforming molecules from one state into a combination of different states. And that's much more efficient, but we don't lose any accuracy in our computed free energy values. Okay, so what does this really look like, right? We call this multi-site lambda dynamics. What does this look like? So this was an example that I did actually in my postdoc but we continue to do similar simulations and, and investigations here at IU. You know, here on the right, we have a ligand shown in our stick diagram, and we have a series of eight different substituents, hydrogen, methyl, hydroxyl, methoxy, cyano, trifluoromethyl, fluoro, chloro, eight different substituents that we then want to sample at three different sites. And these sites are labeled X, Y, and Z on our chemical structure. And on the right, it's just a movie of what that looks like. So, you know, at the base level, it's a molecular dynamic simulation. All of the atoms are moving, again, according to those forces that they feel, right? Like magnets, you have magnets that attract and magnets that repel. And so the atoms are behaving in a similar manner. You have attractive forces, you have repulsive forces. And, you know, when you integrate all of those together, you get a movie of the atomic motion. But lambda dynamics adds in extra complexity in the fact that we not only wanna watch the atoms move, but we wanna switch which atoms are there. And so in the movie at these X, Y, and Z positions, you can see different functional groups are being sampled, kind of popping on or off. And as these groups sample on and off, we can then collect statistics about which ones are sampled, which ones are most favorably sampled. That gives us insight into our free energy differences. And that then lets us rank order all of the different combinatorial states of our compounds according to these computed free energy values that we, that we determine. And in this particular study here on the graph on the bottom left, uh, you can see we have 512 ligands resulting from the eight by eight by eight combinations. And the majority of the free energies are colored black, suggesting that they are changes that are less favorable than what we're starting with. But we were able to identify 55 compounds that were either uh, calculated to be as potent or as powerful or bind as selectively as our starting compound. And then in blue, we have compounds that were predicted to bind better. And so you can imagine just by you know, virtue of screening through a large number of compounds, we can very quickly identify which changes to a molecular structure would be favorable and we can quantify that with our lambda dynamic simulations. We did compare this to like thermodynamic integration, which is one of these conventional community accepted standards that correlates with lambda dynamics. We were able to show really no loss in, in precision or accuracy of our computed free energy values. We we're also able to show that lambda dynamics was 20 to 30 times more efficient, just in terms of the amount of sampling. And whenever you have a molecular dynamics trajectory, you can then dive into that trajectory. You can watch it like a movie. You can study it. You can analyze it. You can calculate distances. You can look at dihedral angles. In essence, you can do a structural analysis to try to understand why are some of these substituents preferred over other substituents? And what's wrong with the ones that are not preferred? And can we learn something about that that could help us in the next round of molecular design? continue to push the envelope and push the boundaries of, of what we know and what we can do. So this was a study that we you know, finished up in 2018, just before I came to, to work at IU. And since being at IU, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with a lot of different investigators and working on lots of different projects. And so this is a project that we've recently you know, written up and is posted as a preprint. You know, my lab has been able to collaborate with Evan Cornett, who's another young faculty member at IUSM. The Cornett lab are experts at looking at protein lysine methyltransferases, which is simply a class of enzymes that add methyl groups and take off methyl groups to uh, lysine side chains and proteins. And we often hear about protein lysine, protein lysine methyltransferases in the context of like gene regulation. So if you methylate a lysine that can turn gene expression on or it can turn gene expression off. And if you have aberrant or you know, erroneous methylation, then you can have things like cancer start to come up. And so this particular protein methylysine transferase that we were collaborating on was called PR domain containing protein nine or PRDM9. 
And Evan became interested in it because it's normally expressed for meiosis and controlling genetic recombination. But there was a recent study that suggested that it was upregulated, it was present when it shouldn't be present in a variety of different cancers, especially lung cancer. And so he thought, hey, this might be like a new target that no one's ever looked at before and no one really knows much about. And so in his lab, he has this amazing technique called, um, uh, let's see, oh, we're gonna skip that, lysine-oriented peptide libraries. So you can imagine that if a protein, my, protein lysine methyltransferase, it's a mouthful, uh, if this KMT can uh, methylate lysines, it should have a very specific recognition register, which means it's not going to recognize any peptide that comes in. It's got to be a specific peptide with specific amino acid sequence that it recognizes. And, you know, PRDM9 is not well studied. It's not really well understood what peptides it likes to bind and methylate and what peptides it doesn't like to bind and methylate. And so the Cornette Lab has this lysine oriented peptide library, which is basically a library of hundreds and thousands of peptides, short peptides with the lysine in the middle and different amino acids on either side. And when they combine their library with the KMT, KMT simply stands for lysine methyltransferase, or in this case, context, PRDM, PRDM9. They combine each of the peptides with their lysine methyltransferase, then they can measure through a liquid scintillation counting whether or not that particular peptide was methylated or not using a radio label. And when they did this, they found something very unusual. You know, so they were going through, they were looking at different amino acids at different positions in the peptide register. So here on the right, we have a graph, a heat map with 20 different amino acids on the y-axis and we have our register on the x-axis. So at P0 is the lysine that would be methylated. P minus one is the side chain that's immediately next to it on the left. P plus one is the, the uh, amino acid immediately next to it on the right and so on and so forth, right? So PRDM9 is known to methylate H3K4. H3K4 is histone three lysine four. But what they found is that H3K4, the sequence for HK4 is actually not the preferred sequence for PRDM9. And this is very unusual because most protein lysine methyltransferases are thought to mainly interact with histone proteins. And here he had experimental data telling him that, yeah, it kind of works for histones, but it works a lot better for something that's not a histone. And this is new and this is exciting. And he was like, okay, we have this data. We don't exactly know what it means. Let's get some structural insight into it. So he showed me this data, you know, in the graph, we have a heat map that normalizes activity from zero to one. So anything that's red is gonna be much more active as far as being methylated and recognized by PRDM9 compared to something that's in blue. And in the green sequence, we have the canonical um, H3K4 peptide sequence at each position. And then in yellow is the, the, the most preferred or a, you know, a separate amino acid sequence from a, a non-histone protein. It was very interesting that he found that P minus one, that isoleucine, so this is this red box, the I and the P minus one column was bright red compared to the threonine, which is the T in the green box. And if you go one column over to the P plus one, again, the lysine and arginine at the top, those K and R residues were much more potent than the glutamine at the Q. And so again, you know, can we understand this? He came to me and we said, all right, you know, can we understand why are the trends like this? Is there any kind of structural or thermodynamic explanation that would explain this experimental data? And so we set out to do lambda dynamics. That's what we love to do. We ran molecular dynamics. We really focused our simulations on these trends at the P minus one and P plus one sites and ran lambda dynamics simulations for about 300 nanoseconds worth of sampling. And we wanted to investigate these experimental trends without going, getting too deep. You know, this is the data we saw, excuse me, that indeed our prediction or our computer predictions said isoleucine was more favorable than threonine 
lysine was more favorable than glutamine. But numbers are numbers are so boring, right? Let's get some let's get some figures in here. And so, you know, when we compare this to experiment, on the left is experiment. You can see in orange is the canonical histone peptide sequence. In red is where we mutate the threonine at the P minus one position to an isoleucine. Then we mutate the threonine to a leucine, that's in blue. We mutate the threonine to a valine, that's in green. And then we mutate the glutamine at the P plus one position to a lysine, that's in purple. You can see that the general trends are the red is preferred, then the purple, then the green, then the blue. And on the right is our computed data with the free energies that we calculate with lambda dynamics. You can see quantitatively, qualitatively, we have excellent agreement here. And so we're able to say, okay, there is definitely a thermodynamic and structural rationale behind this experimental data. Okay, so we had successful agreement in comparing experimental data with our computed data. This suggested that we could obtain structural insights so what were those structural insights? So starting at the P plus one position, thanks. Um, we could see the lysine, which is positively charged, was interacting with two negatively charged side chains, aspartic, aspartate 359 and glutamate 360. And this explains why the lysine and the arginine were so favorable at the P plus one position because opposites attract, right? Positive and minus charged chemical moieties, they like to be near each other. Looking at the P minus one position was a little bit trickier. So we didn't have any charged side chains here. It was a lot of hydrophobic interactions. So the canonical residue was threonine. Threonine has a hydroxy group on it. The hydroxy group likes to interact with water. And what we found is that when this threonine binds to PRDM9 at this particular binding site, PRDM9 was basically shielding it from water. And so you had to, you know, pull out the peptide from water to stick it into the peptide binding site. And that was really unfavorable, right? So we had a large desalvation penalty. And that explained why of the mutants at the P minus one position, the threonine was less favorable than say some of these hydrophobic groups. All right, then we looked at leucine. Leucine is hydrophobic. It'll nestle up next to all kinds of hydrophobic residues. But turns out it's a little bit too big. So we did some distance measurements. We found that the leucine actually pushed the peptide out of the peptide binding site a little bit. This was also unfavorable, but not as favorable as pulling a threonine out of water, right? So we could rank order these things. Then the valine and the isoleucine we found bound with um, comparable conformations. The isoleucine is just a little bit bigger but it's not inducing any negative repulsive sterics. And so, you know, that was preferred. Overall, our main conclusion was an induced fit model of complementarity and size, shape, and favorable non-bonded interactions really explained our peptide sequence specificity. And so then, as I mentioned, you know, we were able to write this up as a preprint that we hope to, to later publish this year. But all in all, this is my last story. All in all, um, you know, these are just really fun examples of things that we do on a regular basis where we dive into chemistry, but we dive into, into chemistry with a computational lens. And we can do that because of the wonderful GPU and CPU resources that are available here at the university that you guys help maintain and support and, and, and even build. So I, I'm excited to see what happens next, you know, big red, like 3000, you know, like, when you know the, when the whole thing is just one big GPU and we can do this in a day. So um, let me just say thank you. You know this is you know all that I really wanted to share. I didn't want to get into the science too much, and hopefully that wasn't too much. Um, let me just acknowledge the members of my lab who do incredible work on a day-to-day -day basis. But you know, really high praise and kudos to each of you and and the work that you do. Um, this research would not be possible without all the efforts that you that you put forth. So. Thank you for everything. Perfectly timed. We have about five minutes. I knew Scott was going to have a, I was already moving toward him. Uh, we'd have a question. So we have about five minutes for questions. Yeah, hi. You mentioned that CPUs or GPUs are much better than 
CPUs. Mm -hmm. Do you have a feel for the difference between carbonate and big red? Oh, that's a good question. Um, don't worry about it if you don't. Well, carbonate, you've got the V100s. Right. Big red 200, you've got the A100s. Um, I guess I don't have a good feel. I haven't benchmarked them specifically. I will say, personally, I have seen things go a lot faster in big red 200. Um, I think there's two reasons for that. So one is um, GPUs are faster, obviously, which we love, by the way. Um, the other, the other thing that we really love about Rigor 200 is there's no user limits. And this might sound stingy and, and I don't mean it to, but you know, sometimes on Carbonate, you know, like you'll submit a whole host of jobs and you'll run into the user limit, even if, you know, several nodes are available. And that just makes things take a little bit longer. But we totally understand why it's there. I mean, fair, fair play and fair share is, is absolutely critical and important on a shared resource like this. Um, but you know that's that's also been very helpful. So you know something that Michael presented back in October was this ladybugs project, and we've had to do a lot of extensive comparisons of our lambda dynamics calculations to thermodynamic integration. Thermodynamic integration can be paralyzed very easily, even though it requires a lot of calculations to do so. And so you know I was thrilled and tickled when the first time I got onto Big Red 200 to submit my TI calculations that I could request 100 GPUs and things could finish in a couple of days rather than a couple of weeks. So nice. And for your information, solid oxygen is blue. Oh, thanks. It's a small data point there. Did I see another hand back in the back, Jefferson? If anybody online has questions, you can throw them in chat. Yeah, I, I really have no background in chemistry, which my subsequent question will make clear. I'm used to thinking of all molecules as being kind of small, but huh? yes. you mentioned small molecule dynamics. How big can a molecule get before it's no longer small? Ooh, that's a, that's a good question. Really? Um, I'm very curious, but... I guess I'd say small is a relative term, right? So that's what I would have guessed. I guess you know we had this beautiful up. picture of the universe, right? And I felt very small at that <laughs> in that instance. Um, and so this is this is the same thing, just inverted, you know. So we routinely do simulations that contain anywhere from fifty thousand atoms to oh. two hundred and three hundred and up to five hundred thousand atoms. I would say a system beyond 500,000 atoms up into a million atoms. People have done those simulations, but I'm not that crazy yet. So I haven't done them, but I admire the bravery of, of people who do. Um, how do you define a molecule? That's a good question. Um, this is all interesting. I had another yeah. question. Okay, yeah. On, on slide 20, the one with the uh, P minus one, P plus one sequence, the side scale, I think you mentioned it, but I wasn't quite sure where it had a bunch of letters, you know, KRHD, EN, et cetera. Yeah. What's going on with those letters? That's a good, uh, here at the bottom or on the left? On the left, the, the one that looks like an alphabet written at random. That's an excellent question. And missing seven So letters. these are one letter coded or one letter codes for the amino acids. Yes, thank you. This is, this is where I got too sciencey and I apologize about that. <laughs> I it think is, with this particular yes. group, I don't think you actually could be too sciencey. There's a lot of domain scientists in research technology. So perfect. So um, in Michael's talk in October, he brought some sort of uh, ML and DL techniques that he's been using for the comparative uh, free energy cal calculations. Mm -hmm. How do you see those types of simulations either transforming or complementing the field when compared to, you know, uh, direct thermodynamic calculations or, or structural equation calculations? Yeah, that's a great idea or a great question. So we've had, a, we've had ideas to do machine learning and deep learning and all kinds of things in the past. And, um, you know, I've written about it in grant proposals. I have no experience doing machine learning or deep learning. So if any of you guys do, I'd be happy to work together to, to you know, incorporate your ideas. And I would say it's also a very active area of research in the field in general. So at national meetings, you know, half the talks talk about incorporating AI and how can we do that efficiently and effectively. One of the best solutions I've seen is, is something called active learning, 
where you run the free energy calculations, you train a machine learning model based on that, and you do several iterations of that until the machine learning model predicts it with comparable accuracy to the free energy calculation that you started with. And then you can use that to just screen through a whole bunch of compounds. So. One last question. All right. Uh, I apologize if this is a little too far afield, uh, but recently, you know, there's been more uh, um, sharing of information about the beginnings of quantum computing as contrasted with classical computing, which is what you're doing right here. Mm -hmm. And uh, they talk about one of the extreme benefits of the quantum computing is uh, the ability for the machine to, to simulate or look at vastly more possible states or superpositions mm -hmm. uh, before collapsing them down. So right. is this something in, in your discipline that may be looking at? Because like we don't have a quantum computer that I know of. We don't have a quantum computer here, but there are a couple of universities and research labs that do. And is that something that you see the research sciences at least, especially in this case where you're testing so many different possible pathways, mm -hmm. is, is quantum computing potentially an improvement or a significant lever for you as opposed to classical computing? That's an excellent question. So I'm gonna put my pitch in now for Big Red 200 quantum computing, BRQC, there we go. So um, I would say, for my work, it's probably pretty far into the future. So I'm not a, qu a quantum computer scientist at all by any stretch of the imagination. My limited understanding is that, you know, your code has to be essentially rewritten for that type of architecture. And I think that's pretty far off for, for what we're doing right now. Um, with that said, I will say I have seen several industries talk about doing kind of molecular modeling, even free energy calculations with the aim of moving them onto quantum computers. So I think like Intel was one talk that I remember offhand where they were really, you know, that was a big focus of their research group. So I think it will, you know, really enter the field quite soon. I think for my own lab's work, it will probably be pretty far into the future. But yeah, that's a great idea and great question. Thanks. So Chris, I didn't even pay him to do this, but that's a great segue. We do have a quantum computing workshop that we're working on creating that will hey. be near the end of April 27th, I believe. Ray Shepard is leading that. So if you're interested in any of those things, watch for advertisements about that. And Jonah, thank you so much for being with us today and teaching us a ton about what you're doing with our resources. And I didn't even pay you, but we could. this could have been a paid commercial. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you.